fall among thousands and thousands my So I'm going to start with this and then we'll get started to prepare the way of the Lord. And uh, the, the line of Judah is, of course, our king. Right. Um, and this song talked about um, to prepare the way of the Lord because he's coming back. But 
how he was the only one able to open up the scrolls that the prophets had spoken that he would come and that he would become flesh and bone. Right. And so um, that he would be the only ones that the only one that was able to, to um, prepare uh, or to tell the earth that he was here and then he was coming back for his church. So um, this song is called lion. It's um, it's by elevation worship. Um, it's a it's a great song to get into to worship um, because he's asking each and every one of us to prepare our families, prepare our hearts, prepare the people around us. Right. For for his return, because if you look around at the world today and what's going on in Israel, he's coming back. He's coming back quicker than we, we could ever imagine. People think that this thing was just going to you know, pass overnight or it was going to last a day or two or, or, or a week, but it's here to stay. This is the beginning of the tribulation. This is the beginning of his return. And, and a lot of people are, are not taking this as serious as it needs to be, but he's coming back. And before you know it, the rapture is going to be upon us. And those of us that that truly believe will be gone in a in a blink of an eye and though there will be those that are left behind and i know that you don't want your loved ones left behind right so god has been preparing this message in me for probably maybe three months now um i think i spoke about it maybe three months ago denora right like god was really preparing this next message that um that we're going to get into right now um but he didn't let me release it yet. So we had other Bible studies going on, right? And then all of a sudden last week when Veronica and I did the Bible study on good and evil, I felt God say now. And wow, how crazy, right? Then everything started happening in Israel and, and you know the Hamas and 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 all these things started going on. It's because he's returning, he's coming back. And um, I'm not sure if who's familiar with what a prophet is, but there are prophets, there are end time prophets, there are watchmen, there are different, different things that people are on these end times. And so we've got to be aware of the gifts and the callings that God has placed upon us to be, okay? I am, I am positive that Veronica is an end time watchman, okay? So Veronica can see things, um, out in the spiritual realm that a prophet like uh, Denora or myself, we're, we're so focused on what God has to say. We don't have, we cannot have that outer vision of the surrounding of things that are coming in. So, I mean, everything is pieced together. So what God has laid upon my heart to share with you guys this week is, um, and it might go into next week too, because this is really important stuff okay so um, i want you to get a pen i want you to get a, a paper because this this is this is your salvation okay because in the book of revelation god opens up to the end time churches right and you would think why why is god talking to the end time church meaning the last days which we're in why would he be bringing church stuff from way back in the old testament or when he walked to old times okay it's because he's trying to get us to examine ourselves now when he talks about when he talks about the church he's not just talking about the church building or the people in the church right he's talking about us because who's the church we are right so we as the church need to examine anything that is in us that christ is trying to get out of us so we can go go up when the rapture occurs so um, John 3, 19, the light has come into the world and the people love darkness rather than they love light. What do you see within the world today? So many people are doing evil that is now good and good is now seen as evil, right? So people are loving the darkness that is in the world, the things that we have said, okay, we're going to go ahead and allow that. And, and it's coming against what the word of God says, right? <clears throat> Let me see. Come on. So it doesn't want to pop up. Let me do this another way. Hold on real quick. Okay. 
Okay, so any, we're going to go to the book of Revelation, okay? Because computer wants to be retarded. Can everybody still hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. So let's go to the book of Revelation. Um, Denora, if you want to get where the end time churches are, I think it's in two or three. Well, I try to get this going. I'm going to stop share. Hold on real quick. Oh, it says to, the message to the churches. Yes. And chapter two, that's when he starts. Yes. Go ahead and start there. I'm trying to see if I can pull this screen back up. You want me to read it? Yes, please. Start with the, the church of Ephesia. Okay, I write this letter to the angel of the church in Ephesus. This is the message from the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven gold lampstands. I know all the things you do. I have seen your hard work and your patient endurance. I know you don't tolerate evil people. You have examined the claims of those who say they are apostles, but are not. You have discovered they are liars. You have patiently suffered for me with that, without quitting. Okay, let's but stop I'm right there. No, go ahead, go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. But I have this complaint against you. You don't love me or each other as you did at first. Look how far you have fallen. Turn back to me and do the works you did at first. <laughs> if you don't repent, I will come and remove your lampstand from its place among the churches. But this is in your favor. You hate the evil deeds of the Nicol Nicolaitans just as I do. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. To everyone who is victorious, I will give fruit from the tree of life in the paradise of God. Okay, let's stop right there. So examination time. We're talking about the church of Ephesus. Can everybody see my screen now? I can see it. Yes. Yes, I can see it. Okay. Uh, Abby, can you see that? Just shake your head. I can't hear you. Sorry. Yes, I can. Okay. <laughs> so uh, examination time, the church of Ephesus, right? The church that lost its love for Christ and his teaching. Now, when you think of uh, you've lost the your, your love of Christ, right? Um, a lot of us may be thinking, well, how can somebody lose their love of Christ, right? So I'm really guilty of this, Okay. So when I first started with the Dream Center, um, I'm not going to lie, like I was I was go hard. I was all about serving, serving, serving. I loved what I did. Right. But then it became a job to me. It became a chore to me. Right. Like yes, I yes. had to go and do this. Right. Not not that I wanted to go anymore, but now I was obligated to go and do this. Let's, let's say prison ministry. I was going and going and going, right? And then it became like, oh, and I got to go to the prison today, right? And it became a burden rather than a, a, a burning sensation, a love for me to go, right? I'm just being transparent and I'm being honest. I'm just being transparent and honest because th this, is, this is what happens with a lot of people. What happens when you get in a relationship? Oh, you love that person. You want to spend 24 hours with that person. You want to talk to that person on the phone, right? And then all of a sudden it starts to windle away, right? And mm -hmm. if they come home for dinner, they come home for dinner. If they don't, they don't, right? So, I mean, we're being honest, right? So that's what God is saying here. When I would go to the Dream Center and I would love to go to the Dream Center and serve, it was because I love serving the people. And then like during the amount of time that I was there, people what? would start to fight, but they would start- Oh, <laughs> can you hear now? Then um, the people would start um, fighting over like cake. You know what I mean? Like who was going to get the bigger cake than the other? Who was going to get the cupcakes or who was going to get the bananas and who was going to get the oranges, right? And so just seeing that kind of stuff kind of dampered my fire, right? So now I didn't love to go and do this anymore. So we have to remember that when when uh, we are burning for God, that consistent love, that consistent love of, 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 of us wanting to serve him, right? Of us wanting to do these things. Not that it's an obligation, 
but that we should want to do these things. We should love to do these things and it shouldn't become a burden or it shouldn't become a hassle. So um, right here, the church of Ephesus, Jesus praises them for one, knowing to known have been late. They labored hard for him. So like I was saying, I labored hard for him, right? I, I served, I served, and I served. And um, the church of Ephesia, they didn't give up. They continued, right? And that's what I was doing. Even though my passion had died out, right? I was no longer wanting to, to, to serve because I was on fire for God. I was doing it more as an obligation, then that began to separate my first love for Christ. So um, the church of Ephesia also separated themselves from wickedness, right? They knew the wicked. So even though I was serving, even though um, my fire was dwindling, I kept myself from evilness, right? But this is what Jesus said that he had against them, having forsaken their first love. And like I said, it became more of an obligation for me to go rather than a passion for me to go. And we've got to stay passionate about what we do, right? Because if you're going to tell somebody about somebody and the words are there, but the emotion isn't there, then what are you doing? You're just, you're just giving them words, right? Mm -hmm. So let's go to this next one. <clears throat> Let me move this real quick. So Ephesus has abandoned its love for Christ and his teaching. The Ephesus church was prominent, commercial, and cultured center. So they were they were a prominent church. They were commercial. They were cultured centered. Like a lot of people were going to this church, right? Christ praised them for their deeds, their hard work, their pres pres perseverance, and for them rejecting false teaching. They knew who, who was, you know, speaking the right words, but they knew also who was not. Despite their hard work and their uh, doctrine integrity, Christ found fault in them. Forsaken love means they came, became less devoted to Christ. They no longer loved what they used to, uh, what they were called to do. Love was no longer their motive to serve like it had been in the beginning. So let's get real with yourself. Are you, are you still in the calling that God has called you to? And are you still addressing it the way that you used to at the very beginning? If not, you are the church of Ephesus, right? And God is saying, I, you got to get this out of you. The solution to this is to rekindle your love for Christ as it once was. Get that fire back. Get that motivation back. Realize who you're doing it for, right? It's not for the people. It's for, well, it is for the people, but it's for Christ, right? So what does that look like today? The Ephesians teach biblical truth. So they know biblical truth. They're teaching the truth. But the love they express to others through them must happen in experience from Christ. If they're not feeling the love of Christ through the things that you're saying, then you're diminishing what Christ is trying to get them to experience. And so you're actually hurting them more than you're helping them. Um, so we've got to reflect the love of Christ, right, through, through uh, the true followers so that they can see it, so that they can feel and see uh, Christ's love in those that he sends. Someone can serve something with no love behind it. How many times have you gone to um, a restaurant and you can tell that the waiter's like really faking it? Like, I mean, they're so nice, right? But you can tell that everything that comes out of their mouth is just a line, right? To get that big tip at the end. This is what he's talking about, all right? So if you have started a love with Christ and it's diminished, he's asking, he's telling you, you've got to get this out. You've got to burn for me the way that you once burned, right? The next church is the church of Samar Samaria. This church was admired for its tribulation and poverty, and they suffered persecution. So Revelation 2, 8 through 11, I want you guys to go back and read this, okay? I'm going to give you the highlights. But this is, this is, welcome to the breakfast table. 
I'm giving you meat that you can go back and you can look at this yourself. Well, look at this. Christ found no fault in them. We should strive to be just like this church. So the church of Samaria, the church that remained faithful amidst persecution, they were admired, they were admired for its tribulation and poverty. They suffered persecution. And you can read all of this through Revelation uh, chapter 2, verses 8 through 11. It's only like four verses, ladies. Open your Bibles. This church was a community of a large group of Jewish people that were hostile to Christians. Now, when, when you think about it, you, you're like, well, Jesus was Jewish, right? So why would the Jewish people be hostile to Christ followers, right? I'll tell you why. Jews do not believe that Jesus has come to this earth yet. And so this is one of the reasons why uh, we see what we, we're seeing in Israel, okay? Mm -hmm. Because God is trying to get them to see who he really is and how they forsake him while he walked this earth. He's trying to shake some stuff in them, right? Just like he's trying to get us to examine, right? So they didn't even believe that Jesus was the Messiah. They believe he was a prophet that walked the earth, okay? They're still looking for Jesus to come to this earth. And that later on, ladies, we'll get into, and it's called the Antichrist. Okay, this church was known for uh, to slander Christians with accusations that led to Christians being persecuted by Roman authorities. So they were persecuted by the Roman authorities. Like they, they, they came in and they spread so many rumors that the Romans came in to try to kill them. But Christ pra praised them. Because even though that they were poor in uh, materialistic things, so they were poor in like, you know, the things that they wore or TVs or, or stuff like this, but they were rich because they knew who Christ was. So they were poor, what looked to us, the world, they were poor, but spiritually they were richer than, you know, anybody that lived in mansions and, and, and anything like that. But Christ also acknowledged that they were suffering by those that persecuted them. And they were wrongfully persecuted, per persecuting them. They were persecuting them for believing in Jesus. So he acknowledged that. He saw that, right? So Jesus found no fault in this church. But he encouraged them to stay faithful, stay focused, because they were hated for the one they followed. He warns that some of them would be placed in prison and even some of them would be put to death. How many of us today are Christ followers and we are being persecuted for following Jesus Christ rather than the world? Remain faithful and stay focused. So what does that look like today? Today, as Christians, we are persecuted worldwide and in awful ways then and in the future. In the last days, Christians will suffer greatly, but the length of the persecution will be short compared to the promise of eternal life. Amen. Focus, stay alert, stay close to him, because he is the only way that we are going to get through these times. There is no other way. If you do not know who Christ is, if you cannot see that finish line and the reward on the other side, you will give up. You have to know who Jesus Christ is and who he is, not to the world, but to you. It doesn't matter how the world sees him. But how do you see him? Do you see him faithful? Do you see him enough? Do you see him as a provider? Do you see him as a healer? Do you, how do you see him? Come on. Because it doesn't matter if I see him that way. How is that going to help you? If you don't know him, you better get to know him really quick. Because he is coming upon us like the, those, those clouds are ready to split. So you better know who Jesus Christ is to you. All right. 
I get a little passionate about Jesus. Hallelujah. Okay. So, this is the church that God really wants me to spend some time in. Um, this is this is America today. This is this is the throne of Satan, okay? This is the church of Pegamos. I, I don't know if I pronounced that right. Um so if you go to Revelation 2 verse 12. You have grown cold. Then to the angel of the assembly of the church of Pergamum, write these words. I know where you live, a place where Satan sits in throne. Look at America. Look at everything that is going around in America. Satan is sitting in America. Come on. There are different gods everywhere in the United States as we speak. There's the God of homosexuality. There's the God of uh, abortion. There's, I mean, there are so many gods throughout the United States and we've become comfortable. It's okay. Let's just turn our eyes on it, right? As long as it's not happening in our household, we're okay. Wrong. Because if you're not speaking against evil, you're accepting evil, right? Mm -hmm. So um, this church was located where there were many statues of many gods people worship. They needed to repent for false teachings. Now, back in the day, um, in this church, in this city, they actually had a statue. And this is what he looked like. Does anybody know who this is? It's Zeus. So Zeus stood, sat in the center of this city. And this is the Pergamus Museum today, right? Um, is this one right here. And Zeus sat right here. Zeus was a Greek god, okay? And they believe all kinds of stuff. But this was surround, this was in the middle of that city. So when you went to the city, all you saw were the temples of many different gods that were displayed in the center of the city. So here we are, good and evil. And this is what we were talking about last week, right? When Veronica brought the word about what is good and what is evil, right? So to learn more about the church of uh, Pergamos, um, you can read that in Revelation 2, verses 12 through 17. So Jesus did praise them for holding their faith in the midst of uh, persuasive pagan influences. So when we're here in America, so many people are trying to change our point of view, change our mind on homosexuality, change our mind on abortion, change our mind on um, allowing two people, but, but they love each other. And isn't it about love? Right. So we should allow two people to marry each other. Right. Wrong. They're trying to change your influence on the way that the Bible sees things. If it if it was wrong, then it's wrong now. OK, if it had God's word says or God tells us that his word is the same when yesterday, today and tomorrow. It never changes. So anybody can bring me um, their argument, but if it doesn't line up with this right here, they, they can they can walk away because they've done lost that fight with me. Hebrews. If it doesn't line up here, I don't want to hear it. I'm at um, they were also known for their pagan practices. So they did a they did a lot of rituals and stuff that um God, God doesn't recognize. <clears throat> Jesus, is, Jesus addresses their sin by denouncing specific members for following false teachings that allow the religious and moral uh, compromise. We're going to let these people in our church, right? <laughs> we're going to allow them, and we're not going to address the sin. I'm not saying that you're not supposed to love the people. Don't get me wrong. We love the people, but we hate the sin. 
We address the sin for what it is and allow God to minister to them through the teachings that we teach. We don't go and change this to conform to, to their way of thinking, right? We continue to teach the truth and allow the Holy Spirit and, and um, to convict them, to, um, them. to, 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 to see them. what he wants to be seen. It's not our job to change people, but it is our job to inform them of the truth. Amen. If you are not informing them of the truth, this right here says that you're compromising. You cannot compromise the word of God. Let me say that again. You cannot compromise the word of God because this is what you're going to stand on trial for. And he's going to say, what did you do with the teachings that I gave you? What did you do with the truth that I gave you to tell people? Did you, did you continue to allow it? Like I said, you hate the sin, you love the person. I have many people in my family that, that uh, you know, are homosexuals. I love them, but I'm not going to support their sin. I'm going to tell them what the Bible says, and I'm going to allow the Holy Spirit and God to do the rest. As long as I pointed them to what the truth is, right? And it's hard and it's uncomfortable. Trust me, I know it is hard and it is uncomfortable. But would you rather them live or die? It's been put in your hands because too many people compromise and they won't speak up. Solution. Jesus calls on them to repent or risk the judgment that will come from the sword of his mouth. Ouch. Do you want to stand before him on judgment day and have that sword? Because it's a double-edged sword. Because it'll you. pierce you. Come on. Um, those who do repent will be given hidden manna, the grain of heaven, and a white stone. A clean slate with a new identity in Christ. Amen. And that's Revelation 2.17. What does that look like today? Like the Christians, then it, it's easy to normalize the non-Christian's behavior of those around us and allow that behavior to dilute our values. When you allow it around you, it dilutes your value. Then you start accepting anything and everything. So you've got to stand for Christ, right? And that's 1 Corinthians 15, 33. We are instructed to what? Not conform to the patterns of this world, but to be transformed by the renewals of our mind in accordance to the word of God. And that's in Romans 12, 2. We have two minutes left. So I'm going to continue probably next week um, on the, the other churches and really get back into uh, what God is saying. Does anybody have any questions or any comments? Um, me, uh, I, I need prayer for some things that I've been doing and um, I'll probably talk to you after this. But yeah, you, you have my number? You yes. Feel free to call me. Um, and you know there's no judgment here. You know that we love you and we are here for you. So I'm going to spend this last minute and 30 seconds in worship and i'm going to pray us out okay um i am so happy to to be able to share this coming weekend with each and every one of you that are coming i i can't wait to to enjoy this time together and let me tell you we've got some surprises that have just popped up that are going to to happen. and so uh, we're just really excited to, to be able to share this time with y'all Father God, right now in the name of Jesus, Lord, we just love you and we honor you. Thank you, God, for waking us up. God, thank you for the fortune of Thank you for us to, to be able to speak yes to you and know to the world, Lord. Thank you, Father, that we will not conform to the world, Father God. We will be conformed by the world. Lord, we honor you and we praise you. And every one of us, and the every one of us, Lord, from the head to the bottom of the blood of life, who was filled with every one of us, Lord, bless our family, keep our family, and we 
we trust in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.